Sure. I'm Melissa Langan. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pediatrics in the section of emergency medicine at Yale University. How are you currently utilizing capnography? We're currently using capnography mainly in our intubated patients and monitoring their ventilation. We're also using it during sedations on our patients and in our patients that have altered mental status, either from ingestions, intoxications, or injury. The newer nasal oral cannulas used to measure capnography in our spontaneously breathing patients are just as accurate as we see in our intubated patients and are very well tolerated in children as well. You recently published a paper on the use of capnography during sedation. Can you give us a brief overview of your findings? We enrolled children in our pediatric emergency department who were going to receive IV sedation for a variety of procedures, such as fracture reduction, laceration repair, incision and drainage of abscesses and other procedures. And our goal was to look at the degree of hypoventilation that occurred in these patients. Specifically, we were looking at hypopnic hypoventilation, which is a decline in tidal volume without a rise in respiratory rate that we see in these patients. Um, this is often not seen and not studied in other papers that we've seen so far. We're using IV ketamine often during our sedations, which has an excellent safety profile. It often does not cause apnea or change in respiratory rate, but we wanted to assess the degree of this hypopnic hypoventilation, which is very difficult to detect on clinical exam. Once we enrolled our children, we were monitoring capnography. We found that 50% of our subjects had declines in their end tidal CO2 values, indicating hypopnic hypoventilation. Some of those were transient, and about a third of our patients had persistent declines in end tidal CO2. We then found that about a, th uh, a quarter to a third of those patients d went on to develop declines in their pulse oximetry. So our patients who had declines in end tidal CO2 were six times more likely to go on to develop hypoxemia than those who did not. What are the advantages you see in using capnography to monitor ventilation? Well, capnography can recognize hypopnic hypoventilation or shallow breathing when just looking at your respiratory rate will not. Most of our clinicians, physicians, and nursing staff use respiratory rate as a measure of ventilation and don't account for the tidal volume that goes into that as well. So patients can have significant hypoventilation while maintaining a normal respiratory rate. Pulse oximetry can have a significant lag time in recognizing changes in ventilation even when supplemental oxygen is not used. Decreases in end tidal CO2 preceded decreases in declines in pulse oximetry by an average of 3.7 minutes in our study of sedation. And while 28% of our patients had declines in pulse oximetry in our study, other studies have demonstrated decreases in oxygen saturation as measured by pulse oximetry in up to 75% of sedation procedures. The detection of hypoxic events can be significantly delayed by the use of pulse oximetry alone. Both hypoventilation and hypoxia have been cited as risk factors for death and serious adverse events in children undergoing sedation. And there is an immediate change seen on the capnography monitor for the physician or nurse to act upon. When hypoventilation is recognized through the use of capnography, it can be intervened upon earlier and the, thus reduce the frequency of hypoxemia seen in these patients. Does your staff find it difficult to use or understand capnography? The combination of a waveform and a numeric end tidal CO2 value allows this monitoring device to be easily interpreted by healthcare providers. These characteristics make capnography easy to use in a variety of clinical settings. Once they understand the basic concepts regarding ventilation, dead space, and the different types of hypoventilation, the staff don't seem to have any difficulties using or understanding capnography but it's important to lay the groundwork prior to using this device. More people are familiar with and understand the implication of a high end tidal CO2 than a low reading. In your experience, is the use of capnography with children practical? Newer nasal oral cannulas used to measure capnography in spontaneously breathing patients are very well tolerated by children. We already use these devices in patients with asthma, intoxications, ingestions, and even in neonates. Nasal cannulas are already used in many clinical situations. While there may be some initial hesitance in the younger children, this is quickly overcome. And older children can be talked through the application of the nasal oral cannula, and it's not bothersome to adolescents.